the industry is not going anywhere. It certainly needs some changes from a regulatory standpoint, but I think the trend is very clear. More and more people want access to legal cannabis, and at some point, everybody's going to get together and figure that out. Welcome to the KayaCast, the podcast for cannabis businesses looking to launch, grow, and scale their operations. Each week, we bring you interviews with industry experts and successful retailers, plus practical tips and strategies to help you succeed in the fast-growing cannabis industry. Today on the KayaCast podcast, we have our very first cultivator that we've ever had on the show, and I'm so excited to share this conversation with Jesus Borola, who is the CEO of Possible Project. Jesus and I sit down and we chat about the future of the cannabis industry. We talk about how to retain good people, how to find those good people. We talk about his cultivation methods and ways that cultivators can be more sustainable and profitable with their business. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Jesus Barola. Jesus Barola is the CEO of Possible, the cannabis farm of the future, an engine of several of California's leading brands with over 2 million units of packaged product to date. Possible is redefining what it means to produce the highest quality cannabis. Jesus is a proven leader who believes in his teams as the primary driver of growth. He leads the organization's growth strategy in sales and operations and the best team at Possible to position the company as a global market leader. Well, Jesus, welcome to the podcast. It's so awesome to have you on the show. And, and I'm really excited to find out more about you and what you're doing at Possible. So, so welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Tell me a bit about your background and how did you get involved in the cannabis industry? I grew up in Mexico. I lived there until I was 18. I grew up around distribution. My, my dad owned a distribution business in Mexico, went to school for distribution and it just seemed right. Go to work in a distributor. So I did that for 15 years and I was looking for the next thing to keep me busy and growing. I had this opportunity to join the cannabis business actually through a friend that I grew up with. He's one of the largest act producers in Mexico in, in high-tech greenhouses. He has a large company called Viva Organica that private labels for the 16 largest retailers in the United States. Cannabis was super interesting to me. I wanted to join it. It was a little scary of like, well, I don't have this expertise and it's agriculture. Knowing that, you know, we had his experience in large scale agriculture and white labeling and, and this great opportunity in a new in a new industry gave me a lot of confidence to, to make the job. What inspired him to create Possible Project? Like why get into cannabis? We all kind of share a passion for the industry and, and for cannabis, but I think he saw a need for a solution. So there were going to be a lot of brand builders that were going to want to build a powerful cannabis brand, but that doesn't really translate well to owning and operating a cultivation facility. How he came about the opportunity was really he was pitched on a cannabis investment. And he would tell you, he came in and it was a, a bunch of Wall Street bankers saying, hey, give us your money so that we can go and we'll take a fee and then we'll buy cannabis farms at a premium. And he, you know, and then he started looking into it and he's like, this is already what I do. I grow in greenhouses. I'm, I'm an ag expert. You know, why would I give my money to bankers when this is something that I have the expertise and the passion to do myself. I want to get into your cultivation and your growing method, because I think one of my favorite things is just seeing those huge cultivation facilities. So what kind of sets Possible's cultivation methods apart from other cannabis businesses? And how do you ensure that you guys have high quality at a low cost point? I think what sets us apart is like our vision for what is the highest quality, most sustainable like lowest cost of production. And for us, that means mixed light. We understand that the market perceives the highest quality to be in like indoor cannabis, but that's a not very sustainable, right? Because it requires, you know, the use of energy to generate an environment. And so it ultimately becomes very expensive for the consumer at the end of the day. And then on the other side, you've got outdoor, which is fantastic cannabis, but it's a once a year harvest. So how do you build a brand around a product on the shelf that starts to oxidize, you know, three months in? It's really hard to do. Greenhouse sits in this middle and it, one, incorporates all the natural elements, you know, natural sunlight, great growing conditions that we have here, but that still doesn't produce the highest quality or like you could still 
put that next to an indoor product and it won't look the same. Our methodology is to really take all those natural elements, but then say, okay, if that gets me to 60 to 70% of what the plant needs, what's the other 40%? And that's where supplemental LED lighting, supplemental CO2, dehumidification strategy, all those things to create the ideal condition with less energy and ultimately less cost is what I think sets us apart. Does that also help with the sustainability because you're getting the, the most important light in there at the right times and letting in moisture or letting out moisture, like it probably all factors into that. Honestly, sustainability is also tied to price. We consume about a third of the energy that an indoor grow goes and energy is not cheap. It helps us reduce the cost and it helps us create the product in a more sustainable way. Are there other companies that are focusing on sustainability in the way that you guys are or you know, is this the future of the industry? This kind of hybrid grow? Because you guys are situated in California. Water is a huge, huge issue there. And so s sustainability has to play into every business that's growing, every cultivation in California, I would imagine. I mean, there's additional things that we do from a sustainability aspect. For example, we don't drain, we don't overwater. We try to basically run this facility with, with zero leche or zero drainage to only give the plant the water that it needs. We are looking at other aspects as well. So we have in this next phase of the project, a natural gas cogeneration plant, because that basically creates a, a closed loop. We'll burn natural gas to produce energy. That'll produce the heating from that source. We'll do the cooling of the greenhouse through that chilling process. And when you burn gas, you produce CO2, which is also what plants eat. Have you been able to develop some unique strains with this growing and this cultivation method? What we've actually created is a system where we work with legacy breeders to R&D and try things here as a production house. As opposed to me breeding the five or six different strains, I get to work with five or six different breeders that each bring me their five or six things and then pick from that. So one, I think it's more efficient, but then two, I think it's also a way to, to work with the community and the folks that have like brought us to where we are today. Speaking of brands, what was the launch and the growth of the Umo brand and how does it kind of align with your overall business strategy and vision for Possible? You know, obviously I'm Latino, born and raised in Mexico. David, the founder is Hector CEO, grew up with me in their CEO since for kindergarten. So we're all Latinos in the space. We've talked to dozens and dozens of brands that have come through the door looking for a supply chain partner. And we kept asking brands like, why are they no Latino brands on the shelf? People kept asking, like, why not you? And, and, and to be honest, that was a very hard decision for us because that wasn't our core business, was not brands. Our core business was production. But we saw this huge opportunity in the market that was underserved to people like myself. We need to be able to control a little bit of our sales destiny. And then if we were going to do that, why not do it through a brand that we felt passionate about as Latinos in the space to bring to market and, you know, really represent our culture. What's your commitment to social justice and equity in the cannabis industry, but also for the Latino community? Possible employs over a hundred people in the Salinas Valley. And I think something very important to note is like Salinas is primarily Latino. Very unfortunately, even though it is a highly productive part of the country, really, that produces most of the leafy greens for the U.S., it's a high poverty rate. And the reason for that is it's all outdoor seasonal crops. So you might have lettuce season and that will go on for two months or you'll have strawberry season and that'll go on for two months. So you've got people coming in and out of employment and that's very hard to do. What possible allows us to do and like a greenhouse methodology is we're a year round grow. So we're providing jobs for people in agriculture here in our local community that are year round and under much better working conditions. What are some of the tips for hiring those quality candidates? Because, you know, hiring for a cultivation facility, like you said, you've got a lot of people. So how do you find those quality candidates that, that you need? We moved to Salinas and we set up this business here because of the great growing conditions. Well, those great growing conditions have actually allowed agriculture to thrive here. So the local community in Salinas has such an incredibly hardworking group of folks that have actually been working at jobs for a long period of time. So as much as I'd say, you know, oh, it's because we, we, we only interview the best people. Like, honestly, we're so blessed that 
Most of the people that come here have worked in agriculture, know what growing plants is about at scale and are not afraid of hard work. Are you able to keep those people? Like, do you have a pretty low turnover rate? Yes, we do. We do. And folks that work here just get better and better. Like our culture here is about, okay, we just had this harvest. How do we get better on the next harvest? And how do we get better on the new next one? Whether that be on the quality side or that's driving costs down as well. So, you know, when we've had folks work here for three, four years, like there's an accumulated knowledge base and where folks have really continued to thrive. The KayaCast is brought to you by KayaPush, the cannabis industry's go-to software for simplifying people management. Streamline your HR, payroll, compliance, and employee management with KayaPush. What are your thoughts on the kind of the current state of the cannabis market? And what do you think the future holds for maybe possible and in the industry as a whole? It's definitely tough times in the industry right now. I think the common thread is like there's price compression happening in almost every single market. I think there's a lot of companies based on the over-regulation that have not gotten into profitability. And the capital markets have kind of dried up. Everybody's really tasked with getting very efficient you know, really achieving profitability because the capital markets are just getting tougher and tougher. The industry has huge potential long-term. I do think it requires some cooperation on behalf of the federal government and the regulations and red tape that exist today. But at the end of the day, this is a $100 billion industry. It's one of the fastest growing industries in America. I just saw some stats, like I think there was more cannabis than chocolate sold this year, right? The industry is not going anywhere. It certainly needs some changes from a regulatory standpoint, but I think the trend is very clear. More and more people want access to legal cannabis. And at some point, everybody's going to get together and figure that out. I want to go back to some of the brands that you've worked with, because you guys power the six of the top 100 flower brands in California. And like you said, at that, at that time when things started getting tough, did you see anything that was kind of a key to success for some of those brands that survived? Yeah, being able to really resonate with the consumer. Like, so you have to have a differentiating part. Like having good flour in a bag is not a brand. Who's your target? What are you doing to resonate with that target base? Like what sets you apart from the next brand? And so, I mean, you have folks like Old Pal that, I mean, every time I look, they're doing something different, whether it's a collaboration with an artist that resonates with their community, whether it's, I mean, there's always something to talk about them. So they keep the brand fresh. I think they know who they are. And I know, I think they know who they're trying to, to basically cater to. That's core to who you guys are is educating your community. And do you see that changing too? Like within the Latino community, we really strive to have a voice to, to normalizing cannabis use. And I think now when 70% of the population has access to legal cannabis, like People have asked me like, what are you, oh my God, what about your daughter? And what about like, my daughter's going to grow up in an age where cannabis was never illegal, <laughs> right? Like, so yeah, I do see a change. Yeah. And I see that stigma changing. I mean, I'm up in Canada and it's the same with my kids. They've grown up basically in a time where it's legal everywhere. And it's such a different stigma than when you and I were growing up. And it was like, it's funny you say like a brand isn't just weed in a bag, like that, that was the brand when we were young, you know, but it's changed so much. And there's these, these huge multi-million dollar companies and amazing cultivation facilities like you guys working to make better product, make it more sustainable. So that's really cool to, to see that change happen in our lifetime. You know, what do you see as the future of possible? Like dream big. What do you kind of see on the horizon for what you guys are doing? I think what we're seeing right now is a shift away from this like vertically integrated model, right? That everybody started with, right? Where it's like, you have to own your cultivation facility. You have to have your brands, you have to own dispensaries. And like, what I think people have found out is like, those are three different businesses. And by the way, cannabis is very capital intensive. We always talked about like how hard it is to raise capital or, or even debt for the industry in general. So like, what we're seeing is people say, okay, I don't need to do all, maybe I just focus on retail or maybe I just focus on cultivation. You know, our goal for possible is that when people think about 
who is the best white labeling solution for an asset like brand that like our name is what comes out of people's mouth. And I think we're on track to do that. That's a pretty bold shift because I mean, having a vertically integrated business was so important, but now you're saying actually you see a shift moving to focusing on more brand partnerships and collaboration within the industry, instead of like, we got to do it all. We just got to, we got to grow it. We got to sell it. We got to brand it. Like you're seeing a shift in that. That's really interesting. I mean, we've talked to some of the largest companies in the state that have said, you know what, we realize like we're not growers. Like that was a mistake. We're going to shut down cultivation and let folks that like that, that's their core value add do that. And then we, our core value is owning retail and operating retail or the brand focus. So yeah, you'd be surprised how much it's going in the other direction nowadays. I really appreciate you sharing that because I haven't heard anyone say that, that, that that's the future is, is moving away from doing it all to focusing on your strengths, which makes sense, you know, but it's the way most traditional industries work, right? You don't, you don't see Coca-Cola saying, you know what, we got to buy a bunch of sugarcane fields and start doing that or start growing corn. They figured out that that's not their value add, right? They're, they're a company that creates a great product. They outsource the production of that product, you know, and they sell the experience and they sell this brand story. It's kind of how almost every other industry works. And I do think that I'm now seeing the shift in cannabis where that's beginning to, to kind of come back the other way. Jesus, if someone wants to get connected to Possible, find out more about what you guys are doing, how can people connect with you and maybe, you know, find out more about what you guys are doing and be inspired by what you guys are creating there? So you can go to our website, www.possibleproject.com, or you can hit us up on Instagram as well. It's at Possible Project. And we'll have all those links in the bio so that people can click on it and, and connect with you. But Jesus, I really appreciate you taking this time and sharing a bit about, you know, what makes you guys unique as a cultivation and sort of the future of the industry. Thank you so much. Well, I really appreciate the time that Jesus gave me and I really appreciated his insights into cultivation. I loved his idea of not creating brand new strains, but partnering with legacy growers to elevate the strains that they'd already produced. And so, you know, there's so many interesting aspects to cultivation and to growing. And I'm, I, I'm just fascinated by the fact that we work in an industry that's based on this product, cannabis, marijuana, weed, whatever you want to call it. And we often don't think through the process of what it takes to get the product itself. I also want to remind you to leave a review for the KayaCast podcast on either Spotify or Apple Podcasts and make sure that if you do, message me and let me know because we are giving away a copy of J.M. Balbuena's book, The Successful Canapreneur for the rest of June. And, you know, you've only got a few more days to leave a review, but it really helps elevate what we're doing here at KayaCast and share that with more people. So, Thanks for listening. Thanks for subscribing. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and we'll see you next week with more stories of cannabis businesses launching, growing, and scaling. Thanks for listening to the KayaCast podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast in your favorite podcast app or visit our website to learn more about our guests and to access the full archive of episodes from the show. Join us next time as we continue to explore the world of cannabis and help you grow, launch, and scale your business.